confession of faith, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's all greet one another. Let's become a person of prayer. And with that, the title today is A House of Prayer for All Nations. We've been examining the Gospel of Mark each week, and starting from chapter 11, the focus shifts to Jesus' journey towards the cross, which is the essential purpose of his coming to earth. Last Sunday, I shared about the events that took place on the Monday after Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It was the incident where Jesus cursed the fig tree that ha had no fruit. And through this incident, Jesus emphasized to us the importance of faith that bears fruit. So what is Jesus' expectation of us? It is precisely to live a life that bears fruit, a life that bears fruit spiritually. We shouldn't but just be someone who has the leaves but no fruit, someone who just goes to church with no fruit. What did Jesus do to that kind of tree? Jesus cursed that kind of tree. It's a very scary message in a way. So although he was cursing a tree, it contains a very important message, and you must realize it's a message that he is giving to yourself. And examine whether you are bearing spiritual fruits every single day. And give thanks to God that you were able to bear fruit during this past week. And look back and think, did I really confess and proclaim the name of Christ with my lips during the week? Or did I just worry about money and the things of this world? Or did I just flail around within Genesis chapter 3 and the concerns of the world? It's really easy once you really evaluate yourself. And in the passage today, Mark, rec Mark records the passage today in the middle of the incident of cursing the fig tree. And this is the event of cleansing the temple. And this is actually a style that Mark uses quite often. And so if you look at a sandwich, the contents of, the in of what's inside the sandwich is what becomes the name of the sandwich. So whether it's a ham sandwich or a chicken sandwich. So the contents are important. And so that's the same with the passage today. Today's passage is connected to the incident of cursing the fig tree and contains the essential message Jesus wanted to convey. So just as the fig tree had only leaves but no fruit, Jesus was deeply saddened by the Israelites' fruitless activities in the temple. And with that, he emphasizes the original function of the temple and the fundamental reason for the church's existence. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so in Jesus' statement that the house is a house of prayer for all nations, there is a message about missions. He says all nations. That includes not only the people of Israel, but also the Gentiles. And so in 1 Kings chapter 8, after Solomon built the temple, he offered a prayer to God. And so in verses 41 to 43, he prays, Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. That was Solomon's prayer. 
So one of the essential purposes of building the temple was to bring Gentiles back to the Lord through missions. The missions to bring Gentiles back to the Lord. However, the Israelites fell into a misguided sense of elitism as the chosen nation. So they fell into that. And what did they lose hold of? They lost hold of missions. And our Korean churches these days are losing hold of missions as well. So as a result, their lives turned into captivity and colonization. Why? Why did they become slaves and captives and colonized? Because even if it was through becoming slaves or through becoming captives, they were to go into the Gentile land and proclaim about God. That was God's method. So even within those hardships and their wandering, they were to tell other people of God's existence. That's what God did. God told them to do missions through the endless slavery and captivity and colonization. However, they did not realize until when, even until this day. Until this day, they still do not realize missions. And there are many people who go to church that focus on missions and are still uninterested in missions, then what happens? Spiritually, they are slaved and captives and colonized. And they will go through the same hardships. It's the same. The word that was proclaimed a few thousand years ago, how does it relate to us? What is the Bible trying to tell me? Why is it still important to me? Through this worship, what is God trying to tell me? I hope you listen to that through the pulpit. That's what a worship is. You cannot keep endlessly living a life of live a life of wandering. And the Israelites have not realized to this day. And so you must pray to God for the grace of realization because asking for all the other things you do not even have to ask for that because God already knows all that that is not important what is important is to understand the will of God and the heart of God and that you are allowed the grace to realize those things and this is why Israel is sometimes referred to as the ends of the earth in this age to the extent that we say if we gospelize Israel Jesus will have a second coming. And thankfully, we are holding on to these essential biblical messages and are taking covenantal and missions challenges these days. So after the construction of the main sanctuary last year, we designated the year of 237 missions, holding on to God's covenant of all nations will be possessed. And we are continuing with the 237 missions. And even last week, we took, we had the work of expanding the tent of missions in the UK. And they went and they proclaimed the gospel and they even did the baptism ceremonies. And I went to the Philippines and we called the important pastors of the region and then for four weeks the pastors went into concentrated training from morning to night and then I went and gave the closing lecture last week and they were so joyful and the face of those who receive grace is different even though the environment was not the best they were staying there for one month they left their churches they left their families and stayed together for a month And so they were so filled with grace and their faces were so bright and they were so thankful and they were asking for us to give to for us to come to Pakistan and give the same training and I've never heard any of them ask for money even though their living environment is not the best they've never asked for money 
And I've been to Pakistan. I've been to their fields and their workplaces and the broadcasting station. And it's really a poor environment compared to us. However, they never ask for any help or aid. If you look at a lot of the poorer nations, they actually have different motivations. They're full of their own motivations, and they wish for some kind of um, financial aid. But in this case, they did not want anything else. They were just giving thanks that they were able to realize the gospel, because the gospel contains everything. But because the gospel does not work out for them, they keep looking to other things and thinking of other things. And so this year, we are continuing with enlarging the tent of our 237 missions. And in the second half of this year, we will be going to Mexico. So we already had the pre-camp. And now we will go on the camp where we will establish the regional church. And then for me, I will be going to the New Zealand camp in the second half of the year. So what is the reason for our existence? What is the reason that I'm living? What is the reason for the church's existence? What does the Lord want? It's not anything else. It's a house of prayer for all nations. As long as we are a church that is led by missions, then that's it. That's a perfect church. And what does Yewon Church mean? It's a shortened abbreviation of the words what God wants. That's what Yewon means. And so I actually asked a lot of people from our church um, when I was changing the name to give their suggestions, but I didn't like any of their suggestions. But then I received a phone call and they said, what about Year One Church? And I said, what does Year One mean? And they said, what God wants. And I really liked that. And so that's why we changed it from Kang Soro Church to Year One Church. And the initial is obviously made up of W E Y E W O N. And so it talks about the five communities. And so people were astonished by that. It talks about the missions community and the oneness community and the remnant community. And so I think someone from our church went and gave a sermon about the name of our church, about the communities and about the next generation remnants. And so they were, people were so astonished to hear about our name. And so I bless in the name of the Lord that all believers of Yewon Church will live the lives led by the 237 nation, led by the 237 missions. The first main point, a house for all people. Verses 15 to 16 reads, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. One of the first things that Jesus did after entering Jerusalem to fulfill his essential mission of atonement on the cross was to cleanse the temple. According to Mark chapter 11, verse 11, we can see that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was cheered by a great crowd and they were shouting out Hosanna, but he was not interested in that at all. He first went to the temple and looked around at everything. And then in the evening, he took the 12 disciples with him and went to the region of Bethany and slept. And then the, the next day, in the very early morning, he went up to the temple in Jerusalem. And upon entering the temple, he immediately drove out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And at the time, the temple was composed of various courts. So after passing through the gates of Jerusalem, 
there would be the temple. And firstly, there was an outer court open even to Gentiles. And it was a place where the Gentiles could come and have fellowship and communicate with one another. It was known as the court of the Gentiles. And after passing through the court of Gentiles and going inside even further, there was the court of women where all Jews, including women, could enter. And then further inside was the court of Israel where only Jewish men could enter. And then going even further inside in the innermost part was the court of priests, which housed the which was the most holy part of the temple. And so the temple mentioned in our scripture today is the court of Gentiles where various commercial activities were taking place. And at the time, Jews from all over the world were flocking to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which was the greatest festival of the Jewish nation. It was like a traditional national holiday in our terms these days. And so people would be living all across um, the nation, which we call diaspora, but on this particular celebration of Passover, they would all gather to Jerusalem. And for this celebration, they would have to offer sacrifices, and they needed to bring those sacrificial animals. But since it was difficult to bring them from the places that they were coming from, which were very far, and that's why for their convenience, people began to sell, sell these sacrificial animals. So they would be able to buy the sacrificial animals at the temple in order to give their sacrifices. And furthermore, to enter into the temple, they had to pay the temple tax. But the Roman coins at the time, which bore the image of Caesar, they were considered Gentile currency and they were not accepted in the temple. And only the shekel currency that the Jews used was accepted. And that's why it led to the emergence of money changers. The problem, however, was that the intention to provide such conveniences to the Jews had become corrupted and it turned into a means for the Jewish religious leaders to fill their own pockets. And specifically, the high priest at the time, Caiaphas, received kickbacks from these merchants, allowing them to conduct business in the court of, of the Jews. And the historian Josephus writes that the number of lambs sacrificed at this time was around 25 million and 6,500 on top of that. And so imagine all of those lambs being sacrificed, there would be so much bloodshed to the point that the temple was covered in the blood. And so the profits from these 25 million lambs would be unimaginable. And so Josephus also writes that more than 2.7 million people gathered for the Passover. And so the number of people who exchanged money would have been enormous, and the exchange rate would have been a large, a very large amount. And so in short, the original role of the temple had long been lost, and it had become a place for robbery. And that is why Jesus turned this whole scene upside down. And Jesus is not someone that would do this, but he completely cleansed the temple and he chased out the money changers. And he rebuked them for making the temple into a den of robbers. That's the situation right now as well. The churches in Korea. 
When they gather, it's all about money. They gather, and it's all about money. And churches fall into trial because of money. There's no God there anymore. It's all about money. There's no prayer. There's no word. It's only money. So it, it had become a den of robbers. Back then and even today. Verse 17 reads, His disciples remembered that it was written, And so in this verse, Jesus rebukes them and mentions the essential mission of the temple. He says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this statement is quoted in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. He says, I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so the term all nations here refers to all peoples, indicating that the phrase house of prayer for all nations carries a significance of missions, implying that not only Jews, but also eventually Gentiles will come to worship God. And currently we are emphasizing the three courtyard ministry. So the healing courtyard where anyone can come and receive healing, the Gentile courtyard where domestic minorities can come comfortably and be established as disciples. And if you look at the bulletin, actually every Saturday, we have people going to the Kimpo region for camp to save the Gentiles. It's in the church bulletin. And I heard that there are many Gentiles living in the region of Kimpo, and there are people that really go, really receive healing and receive the word during that camp. And then we have our children's courtyard, where our future generations are nurtured to become key players in saving the two through seven nations. And it's, it's not possible for our adults. They've already become too accustomed to this world. But our remnants, they must not be shaken or changed or tainted. And that's why the children's courtyard is important. That's why our remnant movement, the first, second, and third remnant movement, is even more important. We do not have much time because many people are not giving birth. And that's why revival in the Sunday schools are very difficult these days. And even for the baptism for the infants, it used to be around 100. However, these days, I only give baptism to around 25 infants. There are no children these days. And we're fighting this spiritual battle. And that's why the churches are closing their doors. And we are entering into the three-day weekend. But these days, it's the four-day weekend where, where there's public holidays. Then they will extend the weekend to the Mondays. And then it will be a four-day weekend. And so, of course, no one will come to church. That's why the doors of churches are closing. And there's no children. There's no young adults. There's only old seniors who are seated in church. And that's why they are renting out or selling their church buildings. And so these three courtyards are important. And we must restore them so that we can spread the gospel to the 5,000 people groups and the 237 nations. And so our Yewan church must become a platform to become the house of prayer for all nations. You must pray for that. And I even made the prayer rooms in our church because I had a personal resentment for prayer. So you can individually go into the prayer rooms and pray for the whole day if you want. Because we have so many prayer topics before God. And so I really hope that we will 
become the spiritual sanctuary for the local and global fields and, and raise up the absolute partisans and we will have the evidence in the name of the Lord. And the second main point, a house of prayer. And so in this passage, it talks about the den of robbers, a den where there is no word and no prayer. And so in the Old Testament, the temple was a place where God dwelled. It was the place where people could reconcile with God and have communion with God. And it was the place where God was glorified. And particularly the expression house of prayer for all nations implies that in the temple anyone could come and pray before God. And so the courtyard of the Gentiles where various commercial activities took place was initially a place where Gentiles came to pray before God and received answers before God. However, this place had deteriorated into a marketplace. And so the Gentiles could no longer come to the temple to pray. It was not an environment or atmosphere where pe people could pray. And so Jesus restored the atmosphere so that people could pray once again. So it should be a house of prayer, not a den of robbers. And what is prayer? It is communicating with God. It's the joy of meeting God. And we must go into prayer for 24 hours and 25 hours and for eternity, but people do not pray. They just try to use the worldly methods, but they don't kneel down before God. Even though God gave the problem so that you would kneel down before God, we do not. And then what happens? Even bigger problems come. Why? Because we are children of God. We must look to God, and that's why God continuously strikes down on us. He takes away our money. He takes away our health so that we look only to God. But if we still do not listen to Him, then He will take our life away. That's what's written in the Bible. Do not be stubborn about this. And so the church, what kind of place should it be? It must become a unity that prays. And praying should be like your spiritual breathing. If praying is difficult for you or feels awkward for you, that person is a spiritually ill person. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 states, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So when you open your eyes, you must start with prayer. Start your day by crying out to your father. When your alarm rings, no matter how tired you are, because everyone is tired, but open your eyes and cry out to the father and say, Father God, thank you for giving me this day. Only Christ, only the kingdom of God and only the Holy Spirit. Let this become the word that guides my life today. And that's the life where you begin with prayer the minute you open your eyes. Of course, God will guide that person's life. And when you pray, the Holy Spirit will work upon you right away. And when you pray, all the force of darkness will be bound right away. When you pray with the authority of Jesus Christ's name, all the darknesses in your family line will be bound and all unbelief will be taken away. And all of the entangled life problems will be resolved. That's why we must pray. So why do you not pray? In the beginning of this year, we distributed the covenant prayer and the vision prayer. And it was all on one piece of paper on the front and back. And we gave it to you so that you would pray according to that. Don't just stick it somewhere in your Bible, but really read through it. Do you still have it? Or do you not know where it is? Make sure you receive them today and pray according to that. Because I have received answers according to that. 
as someone in my young adult age or as a deacon as well, people would call me the person who prayed. Whatever will be bound in, on earth will be bound in heaven. And so people, people would say that elder, they really pray a lot. And those who do pray a lot, they do not say anything rashly. They only say things about the gospel. They only say things that will save others. And you'll be able to see that if you look closely. Why? Because all of their force of darkness and all the disbelief inside of themselves will be bound the minute you pray. As well as this, you should pray in detail for your individual and family needs and workplaces and businesses and your academics as well. Do not limit your prayer. Do not limit the content of your prayer. Just pour everything out to God because God is listening to everything. Even if you record your voice, you will be able to hear everything. Do you think God cannot hear everything that you pray for? And mostly above all, I urge you to pray with tears for the dying souls in the field. Pray for the unbelieving families, for your unbelieving colleagues and your unbelieving friends. Really pray with, with tears to God that He will save those people. Because it is a time schedule where we will expand the tent of our prayer in this way. And Psalm chapter 126, verses 5 to 6 reads, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with, with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And so your tears of prayer for the salvation of other souls will surely bring the fruit of joy. And God will be joyful for those tears. And we have even created a flesh and bone evangelism team this year, and yet you still do not pray or evangelize your family. It's very pitiful. And so really, you'll be questioned before God if you do not work to evangelize. And so the prayer that you do for other people, the prayer that you do for the salvation of other souls, that is the prayer that will bring the fruits of joy. And that's why we say that the stewardship that you have within church is the channel of, pray of blessings because, because of those roles you will be praying even more. And prayer will inevitably bear fruit. It will bring results. Why? Because prayer is spiritual science. And so if, when the parents pray for their children, even after they pass away, their prayer will still be fulfilled. And I've experienced that myself as well. And the reason why I am still being used by God is because of the prayer of my mother. My mother who prayed every single night. And what prayer do you think she did at her old age? And so the famous evangelist Leonard Ravenhill once said this, Satan leads us to neglect prayer because we are so focused on increasing our knowledge of the Bible. Therefore, we should not fall into the contradiction of neglecting prayer while accumulating knowledge of the Bible that teaches us to pray. So people, they work so much and they're so busy that they have no time to pray. That means you're being deceived. No matter how many messages they hear about prayer, if you are unable to actually pray, then that is a failure. No matter how many messages you hear about prayer, if you do not do the actual prayer, that is failure. You must actually do prayer.
just do prayer five, three times a day for five minutes, and you will experience astonishing works. In John chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus emphasizes, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So, year one church believers, I really hope you experience the joy of praying and receiving answers. And do the covenantal prayer through the pulpit message that you receive every Lord's Day. And this becomes the shortcut to saving yourself and the shortcut to receiving blessings and the shortcut to receiving answers. So I bless in the name of the Lord for the year one unity to become a unity of covenantal prayer. And saving lives is the greatest wish of God. And so I hope you bear fruit of saving lives through the prayer that you give. So this is the conclusion. So in Mark chapter 11, it is repeatedly mentioned that after entering Jerusalem, Jesus did not stay in Jerusalem, but actually went outside the city at dusk and went to a place called Bethany to rest. And so the term Bethany actually means the house of the poor. And so it was a very small town and the environment was very poor. However, regardless of that, Jesus did not choose to stay in Jerusalem, which was equipped with the best facilities at the time. He stayed in Bethany to rest. And why did he do that? I think there is a message here for the church. Jerusalem was a field where people tried to kill Jesus repeatedly by exploiting his weaknesses at all costs. However, Bethany was different. Bethany was a place where Jesus could enjoy true rest. In Luke chapter 24, verse 50, it reveals that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he went all the way out to Bethany and he blessed his disciples and then ascended to heaven. So he went all the way to Bethany and he said goodbye and then he ascended. And that is how much Jesus was interested in the region of Bethany. And so the church must become like Bethany. It is a place that received the blessing of Jesus. And so the church must also be like that. It must be a courtyard of Gentiles, a courtyard of healing, and a courtyard of children. So our sky art hall that we have right now, that's a place where the Gentiles can come and enter the church and where children can come and where healing can take place. It's a field. And that's why we yield a lot to that place. And only enjoying the church for ourselves, that's not the church that God wants. God wants the Gentiles to come and enjoy the church as well so that more Gentiles can come and set foot in the church. And then the Holy Spirit will work. We're giving the opportunity for people to receive salvation so that anybody can come and anybody can be saved. I bless in the name of the Lord that our year one church will become that kind of field. Let us pray. Father God, we really give you thanks. We give thanks that we are able to come to year one church, a house of prayer for all nations. And we give thanks that you have allowed us to pray. Please let us be able to experience healing through the word. And let us become the people of prayer that experience how our souls come alive every single day through prayer. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.